Dr. Kelly, you pick up the story. Okay. Well, uh, as usual, I try to make some sort of uh, comments on contemporary issues of the day, and it, it, they actually do relate to the uh, book I did, <clears throat> uh, The Paralyte, Their History and Future, that's offered by Radio Liberty, because that book, uh, as the subtitle says, Their History and Future, uh, goes into the background, starting with the Knights Templar about a thousand years ago, but then it looks at the future, it looks at the, the 2012 election, and then I said from that what would happen in 2016, and then I said who would be elected then, and I said who would be elected uh, in generally in 2024 and uh, to prepare the way for 2025, and what Alice Bailey said would be uh, the rapid shape of the world state, the world federation of nations, she said by 2025 would be taking rapid shape, and she said that back in 1933. And so... I'll uh, <clears throat> cover about three things uh, in terms of recent or current events uh, before getting into into that book, because it all fits. And what I try to do is uh, piece together all of these things, sort of like a puzzle. You, ha you have people who do a lot of research, and they, they see one aspect of it, and they focus, let's say, on the Bilderbergers and so on, uh, but they don't see the overall aspect. And even those who see the overall aspect today don't really, ha really have a firm grasp on where it came from and the interrelationship over centuries between movements and groups and and who who set whom up and then in turn where that projects into the future and uh, so uh, I'll, I'll use the the format of uh, I uh, where I am uh, is very very near it's only about four blocks away from a major university of about thirty thirty five thousand students. And they have a tremendous number of foreign students there from China, India, you know, everywhere in the sun, Ecuador, Brazil, you name it, they, they have them there. And so uh, they often uh, come to the shopping center. It's, a, it's an extremely large shopping center between where I live and the university. So it, it's like a place with about 80 restaurants and, you know, sh with different shops and all kinds, you know, Japanese restaurants. All kinds of shops, uh, Hispanic, and the, you name it, in various fashions, and two grocery stores, and you know all, the whole bit. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of them around there, and I'll overhear them. Like last night, I was in the grocery store, and I heard French, and so I asked the the, the, the girls, "What do you speak French?" And so I say, "Bon oui," you know, try and con converse. Or, and as uh, one girl works there, she's from Siberia, and then where my uh, mother was uh, in about a year ago in the nursing facility, uh, block uh, the other direction, there's a fellow there from Siberia. <laughs> so anywhere, it's, they're, they're all over the place. And so, you know, I, I speak a little Russian to him or something. And so, uh, to use this as an example, uh, the security guard up at the grocery store at night is uh, from Liberia, and he's getting his doctorate in economics. And so we'll spend a fair amount of time when he's not, you know, on duty. And he would say, what are the economic indicators? And I said, well, you know, just watch George Soros. And I explained to him, and I give him these articles about what George Soros did to the British pound in 2010. In December, he's looking like he's going to do the same thing. And, you know, he's very interested in it. And so uh, the next thing would be this woman. Hold up, hold up, Dr. Cuddy. We're going to be back in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy right here at Radio Liberty. And you go ahead and pick the story up there, Dennis. Uh, uh, right. And so I, I, I get him coming around <laughs> slowly, and uh, but surely. He's, he's, he's very studious. And so uh, then I was talking for uh, uh, some time uh, to a woman from Nigeria. And she's from the Christian South. And uh, uh, she was uh, explaining uh, the great falsity of the news that we're getting from ABC and every NBC and the rest of them out of uh, Nigeria about Boko Haram and what they're up to. It's like the media has just discovered them. And, of course, she and I know that they've been around for a long time. And uh, they've been slaughtering, you know, Muslims and Christians and everybody under the sun. And uh, Boko Haram, uh, the expression, actually means Western uh, education is bad or sinful like that. They want to really have a strong theocratic uh, Sharia uh, law state there is is what they want, uh, but uh, she she kept wondering. She says she said I want to know where they get the weapons. Where are they getting the money of these weapons? And I said, well, you know. And so I always explain these in terms of this power lead and their master plan. And I said I had already told her I I told her what happened to Libya and why it happened. 
why we overthrew Gaddafi at the time we did. And, and that's important. It's not just that Gaddafi was overthrown, but overthrown at the time uh, that we did, because uh, the parallel projects into the future many, many decades, uh, way in advance. And that's why they prepare people. They prepare a young Bill Clinton for his eventual presidency. They prepare a young uh, Barack Obama for his eventual presidency. They prepare Hillary when she's a girl at Wellesley. And, and, you know, they all of this stuff goes on way in advance. And so they will strategically uh, place people. And so I hold that thought. Hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dennis is talking about the some of the students there at this major university as a chance to talk to, and basically, of course, explaining to them that everything going on is planned, usually many years ahead of time. The why are they planned the overthrow of Libya and Egypt and all of these countries over there, and certainly a lot of these students from Africa are trying to make some sense out of what's going on. It doesn't make any sense unless you understand there's a power elite that rules the world. Their ultimate goal is the destruction of existing civilization, a one-world government, a one-world financial system, and, and certainly the destruction of Christianity and this imposition of the one-world government. And of course, these ideas are somewhat strange to these students from Africa, but go right ahead, Dennis. I'm sure you're convincing these people and pointing out how this is long-range planning to bring us to the crisis situation we're facing today. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and that's what they use. They use crises. They create consternation, chaos, crises. And from that, they bring their order, you know, order ab chao, order out of crisis. And there have been articles, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, I remember in Education Digest, there was an article about how you could use crises in education to get the, the changes that you want. This was from the perspective of a, a rather progressive or liberal educator. So they, they've used this strategy in, in many, many fields uh, all, all over the place. And so in this particular case, I had previously explained to this uh, woman about uh, uh, Gaddafi was overthrown. We knew that al-Qaeda was involved in that, as well as the, you know, the eastern uh, people of, of Libya revolting against Tripoli and the, the western part, which was Gaddafi's base. And I had already told her how uh, the Al Qaeda members, and I said, I, I have their pictures, I have their names, I know who they are. And at least three of them were given high profile administrative positions. And one very important one was in charge of border control. And so the weapons uh, that they uh, got by overthrowing Gaddafi uh, went up to, there was two movements across Egypt. One went up to the rebels in Syria because we were supporting them covertly, you know, to uh, try and overthrow Assad. Uh, actually, we weren't trying to over. We're, we're not trying to overthrow us. <laughs> that, you know, that's what people that we're trying to overthrow. No, not really. But we'll get to that later. Uh, so we want to create some chaos there, some consternation. So we we provide armaments uh, for the uh, the rebels in Syria, and a lot of them, in fact, maybe you know, sixty seventy percent went to them. However, specifically the anti tank rep- weapons I explained to her went across Egypt. Now remember, this is Al Qaeda border control and escorted across Egypt with the knowledge of the Muslim Brotherhood, who at the time uh, was in charge in Egypt, uh, to Hamas. Uh, because Hamas said, we have a plan, and as soon as they said, we have a plan, and this is before they launched the rockets, I said, I know what your plan is. I know you're going to launch these rockets, and I know why you're going to launch these rockets. And let me just clarify, what Dr. Cuttis is talking about is we are financing this whole world Islamic terrorist movement, but we can't let the stupid people in America know that. <laughs> the, the terrorists are supposedly our enemy. They want to destroy us. Ladies and gentlemen, we created this. We financed this terrorist movement. You have to have an enemy uh, because the, the whole idea is conflict changes the world, and we're moving towards the climax of history. Uh, and the total disruption of existing society and the supplementation of this new wonderful utopia under uh, it's this small ruling oligarchy. I said they had two class system, the very rich, and then the great masses of impoverished and enslaved. Go right ahead. Yeah, and uh, just as an aside briefly, when you mention oligarchy, uh, I want to reiterate to your listeners that <clears throat> uh, what uh, uh, Jack London uh, the famous author, you know, Call of the Wild and all that. Uh, he wrote the, the Iron Heel in uh, in 1907. It was sort of a forerunner of Orwell's Big Brother. Uh, you know, a boot stamping on a human face forever. This he called it the Iron Heel. 
And anyway, in that book in 1907, he said W.J. Kent, G-H-E-N-T's uh, book, Our Benevolent Feudalism, a few years before that, 1901-02, uh, was the model that the oligarchs and plutocrats would use for the future. You know, a benevolent feudalism. At least that's the way it would appear. You know, we'll take care of you. You just go along with us. Don't make waves. We'll see that you're treated kindly and, you know, you be happy in your lot in life and let us, you know, let us rule you. We're, we're the new philosopher kings, you know, <laughs> sort of like that. So anyway, uh, so back to uh, what they did with uh, the uh, uh, rock anti, uh, well, anyway, there were two venues. One went across the Syrian rebels, and then the anti-tank weapons went across Egypt from Libya, eastern Libya, up to Hamas to use against uh, Netanyahu and his Israeli forces, they would pound them from the air, but then you can't really finish off Hamas unless you have a ground uh, uh, war. And so uh, usually infantry is led by tanks in the front, and so that's what Netanyahu was doing. He was preparing his ground troops, and he had the tanks, and then all of a sudden he came to a screeching halt because he said, oh, my goodness, look, they just they have gotten from somewhere these anti-tank weapons. Well, you know, that was planned all along. That's one of the reasons why Libya uh, had to go. And, of course, that's one reason, perhaps, uh, why um, Ambassador Stevens uh, had to go as well because people were starting to sniff the wind in Congress and saying, you know, I wonder if we knew about these weapons going up to Hamas. Now, the basic question was you're talking about is Benghazi scandal right. where the four people were killed. Okay, go right ahead. Okay, and so I had already told all this to, to the woman, but I said, well, you know, Boko Haram got them from the same place. She said, uh, are you kidding? Uh, are you, you, you serious? Like that? I said, yeah, I'm serious. And so I went out and I, I got a copy of this uh, this article not too long ago. It's uh, uh, May 8th, and it's by Abe Greenwald. He writes for a commentary magazine. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just read the very beginning here. And I, I handed it to her, and she just, her jaw sort of dropped. Says, the article just begins like this. Add another drop of tragedy to the story of America's reluctant, no boots on the ground operation in Libya in 2011. Weapons that were never secured after Muammar Gaddafi's ouster made their way to Boko Haram. See, that's the, that's their view, commentary. That's the view of the press. They, they, they just made their way. Uh, just somehow weapons make yeah. their way. Yeah. Weapons are transported. They're transported by the people we give them to. Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. But they just made it. And the Islamist terrorist group are now holding hundreds of Nigerian girls. Last May, Boko Haram staged an attack, so forth and so on. So anyway, it goes on. The the attack by Boko Haram that it's talking about uh, had substantial firepower, including machine guns, large numbers of rocket-propelled grenades, you know, the RPGs, the favorite tool of terrorists in Iraq and everywhere else, and pickup trucks mounted with anti-aircraft guns, a sign the weapons flood from the Libyan war that helped rebels seize parts of Mali last year as reached Nigeria, officials say. So Boko Haram isn't just limited to Nigeria. They go up to, they, they're you know, sneaking over into Cameroon, into Mali, and that whole uh, what's called the Zagreb region there. And uh, they're not going to be limited to that either. And um, so the Nigerian girl was said, well, that's really something. And she's very, very familiar with the North and the Hausa uh, uh, people there who are largely uh, uh, Muslim, Islamic. And that's one reason they really haven't cracked down on Boko Haram, because, you know, they're Muslim as well. And plus, you know, there's the threat of if you do crack down on what, uh, what might happen to you. And uh, she says, you know those people, the government up there, uh, know what they're doing. And then she said she got furious with the American press. She said the American press, uh, the ABC and NBC and all these people are, are putting out the story that, well, Boko Haram is just a response to, to poverty. They're very poor. Oh, and then they show, uh, ABC or whatever, they showed a film of this poor region in uh, in northern Nigeria uh, where the Muslims are. She said, yeah, but that's in the inner, in, you know, the inside of the very, very rural area. She said the vast majority of northern uh, Nigeria uh, the, the capital, you know, Lagos and all of them, she says, they haven't had a power failure in 10 years. They've got skyscrapers. She says the sultan of, you know, some state up there, the emir of another state in uh, northern Nigeria, 
They have lots and lots of children by, you know, their multiple wives, and all of them, even though they're filthy rich, all of them are on full paid scholarship to university. She said they're rolling in tons of money. And she said they just are completing or in the process of completing a $3 million widening of the Niger River so that so that they can have direct access to a port. She said, we have ports in the south, the Christian area. We have ports. They don't want to use those ports. They don't want to dredge those ports. Why? Because we're Christian. They want to have it all to themselves in the, in the northern part of Nigeria. And so she said, it's, it's a farce what, uh, what they're doing, and the way they're, they're, the news media is portraying this. Uh, it's, it's a total farce. So I said, well, I, I'm sorry. Uh, it's all part of this plan. And I said, it's the same thing they did with Kosovo and, you know, the same thing they did in Iraq and the same, you know, all, all over the place. And she said, I said, I asked her, I said, okay, uh, what's going on with this uh, dredging to create a port on the west coast of northern Nigeria, which is basically the Muslim area? And she said, well, there's three companies that are getting the three trillion dollars. Now, before she can even say what the companies are, I have a sort of idea of who they might be. She said, number one, da 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 Halliburton. <laughs> you know, I said, aha, Halliburton, you know, of the Middle East and, and fame and the whole background of 9-11 and Iraq and all that sort of stuff. And she said, yeah, in the Burger Company of Germany, I said, aha, a German company, as in that's why they had to get rid of Milosevic, was because he was blocking German access to the Mediterranean. And she said, and one other, let me guess, Chinese. <laughs> yes. And she said at first, she said there was a Chinese company, and again, I wasn't surprised. So here you have China, which is putting tons and tons of money into Africa, and you've got the Germans, who are basically ruling Europe, and then Halliburton, which is a sort of American and ubiquitous, it's multi-ownership. And so these three companies are building this, dredging out this huge three trillion, not billion, not billion, but three trillion dollar project in northern Nigeria, right? And so they want to try to make nice with Boko Haram, just like the Saudis did with the Wahhabis, from which um, uh, Osama bin Laden came. You know, so that's what's going on. They know where they are. She knows it. She knows they can find Boko Haram whenever they want to. Okay, fine. Hold that thought. We're going to be back in just a moment with Dr. Cuddy. And very little of what you've been told is true. All right, Dennis, you go right ahead. Okay, so anyway, what's uh, what's happening? I don't want to belabor it, but what's happening in Nigeria, if the media were to tell the truth, is part of this larger power elites plan. And the same sort of strategy is being replayed over and over. Uh, but because the public is kept ignorant, they don't see it. You know, they don't see the, the similarities <clears throat> in events. They don't see the timing and so forth and so on. All right, now, uh, back to uh, domestic uh, politics. Uh, Dr. Stan has had in the past this, uh, this uh, rather uh, important debate today over Common Core, and he's had uh, Orlean on, who's uh, done a really good job and a good book on that. And what I want to do is, and I've, I've mentioned it before, and I think I probably in the future will write some sort of news with news column about the background. I don't necessarily want to go into all the details because a lot of people have already done that. But I think in piecing together the larger picture, the larger puzzle, I'll probably go into some of the background and then point out the connections today. It's very important. Uh, to, to look at uh, Mike Cohen, who many people, even many researchers uh, in Common Core, very prominent people, don't pick up on him. And he's strategically important, along with uh, you know the, the other people, like the, the head of the college board, uh, who's a Rhodes Scholar, and then uh, others as well. Uh, but Mike Cohen is uh, interesting, going way, way back. And in fact, uh, I think if you look at uh, Mike Cohen's background, uh, he has made his way to the, the very top of many organizations without really much educational background. I, I, I don't think he has an advanced degree in anything. I, don't even believe, I think it was in telecommunications or something like that. So he's uh, one of those who's been strategically placed as well. Uh, but in terms of politics and in terms of the future, uh, and uh, people are saying, just like uh, before the 2008 election, Glenn Beck, uh, Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh said, no way Barack Obama is going to be reelected. You know, the unemployment is too high. 
nobody in our presidential history has ever been reelected with that point that high. That high, and I said, "Oh, yes, he will be," and so forth. Well, the same sort of thing is like Jeb Bush. You have him today. Uh, Glenn Beck and others saying, "Oh, Je- you know, Jeb Bush is one of these moderate establishment Republicans, and you know he's he's not going to make it, and so forth and so on, and, and the people are going to rise up, and so on." And, and so I'm just saying, "Well, let's let's just wait and see." So, what's Jeb Bush's connection with Common Core? Well, Jeb Bush way back formed his uh, his foundation. Uh, it's called Foundation for Excellence in Education. You know, catchy title, right? <laughs> and what is their their goal? Success in education. And I said, wow, I mean, you know, that's really challenging. Like, how can you measure what, what it doesn't say they're going to improve reading uh, by a certain percent, no, just success in education. So it's one of those general foundations for excellence in education. Well, uh, what you find out is that, uh, and this comes uh, from an article not too long ago, uh, I believe it's by Michelle Balkin. It's only, you know, back in 2003, I mean, 13 about, you know, nine, ten months ago. And in this article, she says, uh, one of Bush's foundation's behemoth corporate sponsors is Pearson, P-E-A-R-S-O-N, the multi-billion dollar educational publishing and testing conglomerate. Pearson snagged, now remember this is back in September, back in September, snagged the uh, multi-million dollar contracts to design the first wave of uh, P-A-R-C-C, that's Partnership for Assessment. Hold that thought, hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dennis is simply pointing out that most people certainly have no idea what's going on. Certainly, before the last presidential election, all of the experts, uh, certainly uh, the writing, certainly even for the conservative point of view, were sure Romney was going to be elected. And the only person I know who said, no, it's going to be, I said, they, it's going to be Obama. Why? Or because the establishment wants him. The establishment runs things, and they will put Obama in there one way it means or another. And then, of course, uh, we're coming up to another election in 2016. And so uh, Dr. Cuddy feels very strongly that Jeb Bush is going to be a very, very real candidate, the third in this new Sydney artificial line of, of presidents of coming from the Bush Foundation and the Bush family, which is, of course, a very powerful, subversive organization. But, but Dennis, you go right ahead and you're talking suddenly about, about, is this about really more about Common Core? Or right. What? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, it, like you said, this, this lineage here uh, is hereditary. And that I remind the listeners that Philip Freneau's article in 1792 and the July issue of the publication called American Museum talked about the hereditary elite, which was to, to come and to try and take control of America. And he spelled it all out. <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, what, what happened is uh, his foundation is uh, tied to the hip, according to Michelle Malk, and she's correct, to the federally funded uh, consortium called Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. And they raked in uh, $186 million through uh, the race to the top, that's Obama's program, race to the top to develop nationalized tests aligned to the Common Core program. So you have this alignment. And so keep in mind that this this outfit, the multi-billion dollar educational publishing uh, testing conglomerate, Pearson, is one of the big corporate sponsors for Bush's foundation. Okay, so the company itself holds, uh, I think it says here, a $250 million contract with Florida alone to design and publish its state tests, and Pearson designed New York's Common Core Aligned Assessments, and is also exclusive contractor for Texas state tests as well. So here you have them joined. You have the Bush Educational Foundation to get tons of money uh, from Pearson. Pearson is the uh, leading provider of publishing and testing uh, for Common Core. And so you see how these pieces of the puzzle fit together. I think it's so important that people understand education has nothing to do with teaching people facts and preparing them for life. It is preparing them to be global citizens in this wonderful new utopia that's planned. And basically, this is what they're really teaching our kids, that they're putting off calculus. They're certainly not teaching them adequately. Compare America's class kids when they graduate from high school, and they have a hard time 
competing with people from Lithuania and Latvia. Why? Because they're using our educational system to destroy the hearts and minds and souls of our children and certainly to destroy their faith in God. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and, and Common Core is like redesigning everything, including the, the, the values that it's going to be teaching. Uh, but uh, what you have is, uh, is they will say, oh, well, we're now integrating, you know, geometry and algebra. And uh, Common Core is math 1, 2, and 3, ninth, 10th, uh, and 11th grade. But in, in, I pointed out to one of them, in other nations like China and in India, for example, uh, they do that, but they also add uh, trigonometry and calculus. You know, to the integration. So well, we don't have time for calculus in high school anymore. <laughs> I've right. been here, gentlemen. Common Core is taking calculus out of high school. Why? Because they're going to dumb down our kids. And where is the outcry that you're reading about in the newspaper? You're hearing about from Glenn Beck and the others. Why is deafening in its silence? Go right ahead. Uh, well, I, I asked a, an education official with the government about that. She said, "Well, they they can still take calculus. You know, it's voluntary." I said, "But it's not part of you know the Common Core." Well, no, not yet. We'll we'll take another look in 2015, and who knows? <laughs> Maybe then. But a, anyway, so they're redesigning uh, everything along those lines, and what this does, Common Core. I wrote articles like 20 years ago for uh, Pro Family Forum's uh, newsletter with Dr. Shirley Carell. And at the time, and I, I have, you know, two or three articles in USA Today on their editorial page about, you know, beware of national standards. Uh, but what this does, at the time I was saying, well, you, you, if you have national standards, then people are going to have to align their curriculum to it. And so we'll have a national curriculum. I was warning people. Well, the added little wrinkle in this is they're going to have these. this Common Core becomes a testing device. And so what testing will do, uh, including SATs, which is the college board, uh, will lasso in uh, the Catholic schools, the private Protestant schools, any parochial school, any private school, and the homeschoolers. Because if you want your child as a homeschooler to go, you know, to UCLA or something, then you're going to have to align what you're teaching that child if they're going to get a good grade on the SAT. So this is this is one step even more than they've tried in the past. But of course, the good grade doesn't mean anything. Basically, the grade is going to reflect whether you're going along with this utopian socialist agenda, not what you know or how you're going to be able to apply it in life. Okay, Dennis, you go right ahead. Okay, well, one other thing of uh, contemporary interest is uh, there's a chapter in my book, we've already covered it, about the psychological conditioning of Americans and the use of uh, misdirection. And uh, the thing that uh, I would point out there is uh, Edward Bernays in 1928, his book uh, Propaganda, talked about uh, they were able to manipulate us. They're like, uh, they, he said, the scientific means are now available, or we're like an invisible government, and so on. And so one of the uh, uh, the processes that they used is uh, a sort of psychology akin to the Chinese water torture, you know, the slow drop of the water, that, that bit. And so what uh, what they will do is they will uh, get the public all excited about something. In the past, it might be about sex education. Let's have a rally against sex education. And the people would all show up. They know 5,000 people come to the county, you know, headquarters of the educational uh, uh, system of their state and a rally against sex education. And they have various ways for dealing with that. You know, they will say, well, the meeting is postponed until next month, you know. And then they'll form a committee, and yes, we want to hear your concerns. And they'll let people vent their frustration, you know, get it off their chest and so forth. And the whole idea is if they keep that process up long enough, the people will grow weary. Now, in the past, 100 years ago, the people wouldn't grow weary. The people would actually grow stronger. But remember what I said. They've been planning for 50, 60 years to make us a sort of temporocentric, as I call it, society, meaning we, we tend to emphasize the now. Uh, Orwell said, you know, keep them busy. We quicken the tempo of human lives. Go, 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 go. And what you do is you wear people out. You know, you, basically, if you're running all over the place every day, you know, taking Johnny to the baseball game, Susie to ballet practice, uh, go over here for the luncheon meeting of the women's auxiliary, go, 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 uh, all over the place, you're sort of tired, right? <laughs> so you don't have a lot of energy at night to, you know, go to the PTA meeting or some sort of meeting to discuss uh, what's going on in the schools. Well, it's, it's the same sort of thing 
uh, with a Common Core or anything. Uh, they will let you hold lots and lots of rallies, right? And they'll encourage you, come on, let's go, let's organize again. And so what they have done over about a 60 or 70 years ago. Hold that was, thought, hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dennis is simply pointing out how they how they dissipate our energies, right. and they they will allow certainly uh, demonstrations. They will allow certainly uh, people to attend the meetings, uh, certainly of the various government committees. But but it's all there. You just go there, you get up and talk, and nothing happens. Right. It's all to wear you down. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, this is correlated from the top. Uh, they control these committees. What you need to do is get on these committees and take them over. What you need to do is get your kids out of government schools because they're going to destroy their hearts and minds and souls. That's the purpose of education is to destroy the souls of our children and to turn them against God. They've done a wonderful, wonderful job. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and certainly if you haven't read his books, we do carry a number of them. You can get them by calling 1-800-544-8927. But the two we're talking about right now, the Power Elite and the their secret plan and the power elite, their history and their future. Dr. Cuddy, go right ahead, but people must understand we're moving towards a fascist, feudal dictatorship, a two-state system, a small ruling oligarchy, and then a great mass of people who are being watched and monitored all the time as the government accumulates ammunition and automatic weapons and armored personnel carrier for our local police forces. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom is we've known it is simply going to soon be a remembrance of things past but most people aren't concerned because life is just so good but I will tell you one thing and I'm firmly convinced of it and it's all about to change if not this year or next year go right ahead Dr. Cuddy uh, yeah I think you'll you'll start to see the, a major uh, shift downward in 2016 to you know prepare the way for Jeb Bush uh, in his uh, coronation <laughs> Whatever you want to call it, uh, yeah, and uh, and Common Core is uh, is uh, is part of this uh, the the wearing down process. You you hold rallies and so forth. But like Doctor Stan said, uh, you go to these meetings and you know you you feel real good after you come out. Yeah, well I told them. Yeah, and how about you, Jane? Yeah, she Jane told them. But in the end, you know, after five or six of these meetings, you finally start to wake up and say, Well, yeah, we did a lot of talking, but nothing change <laughs> so they, they don't they, they have these strategies for wearing you down as dr stan said dissipating your energies and it's only possible though see this is where i i try to emphasize a lot of people will catch that they'll say oh yeah it looks like we're going to these meetings for nothing what what they don't understand is that uh, this uh this is a psychology that they use uh, uh many times that is only successful because they have changed the thinking of the people from 50, 60, 70 years ago. The people 50, 60, 70 years ago were very strong, uh, very tenacious. If they had an issue like Common Core, they would rally. If some administrator tried to pull a fast, you know, delay it, they would. somebody would look into, okay, now what do the bylaws say for removing those board members? Uh-huh, uh, a thousand signatures, okay, let's get them. You know, <laughs> that's what they would do. Uh, and they and they would make the time for it because back then, uh, if you watch these old Andy Griffith shows where they're sort of rocking on the front porch like that, uh, it was a more leisurely time. And that doesn't mean you know lazy. It wasn't lazy, but it was a more leisurely time where you had time to reflect and read. I remember my father. He used to come home and read the paper, the newspaper, like from from the first word to the end. He would go over the whole thing, and he would be looking for you know all kinds of bits of information. Uh, and he you know he had a good mind, and he he, he knew how to analyze things. And so and he was somewhat typical, somewhat typical. Uh, of a lot of people back then. They took a great deal of pride in educating the immigrants who came over in the 1920s. Now, one thing, those immigrants from Italy or wherever it was, uh, they, could, they couldn't speak English. The parents couldn't, but they said, you, you know, you will go to school. You will behave. You will learn. You will study. And if the teacher disciplined in school, you know, when they came home, they got discipline there, too, uh, because it was serious business. I remember when I was in elementary school back in the 50s, 
you would have to stand. You call on you stand by your dentist. He has to have attention. You know what is the answer, Dennis? Uh, the answer is you know, like like that. It was somewhat serious. And then in the 60s, I remember when I came back to teaching, it all changed. It all changed, you know, the hippies, the students' rights, and now it's very casual. And the students would actually say, well, this isn't fun. I said, yeah, you, you know, you get fun at recess. When you get out of school, you have fun. Education isn't supposed to be fun. I mean, if you can make it sort of pleasurable, fine. But it, it's not a requirement. The teacher doesn't have to make it fun for you to, for you to learn. I mean, what are you going to do? You get in the work, uh, work a day world. You're going to tell your boss, well, boss, you know, this isn't fun. I quit. <laughs> really? You're going to do that? So anyway, and the reason they, they were able to do this is they had changed the thinking to what I call a sort of temporocentric, uh, attitude. If you quicken the tempo of human life, you tire people out, you wear down their energies, they don't have time to go to the fifth meeting of the anti-sex ed committee of you know, concerned citizens or whatever it is, uh, and they're you know the next day they're going to be busy again, and so they become uh, very frustrated. Uh, they say, "Why bother? You know, it doesn't do any good." It's sort of the why fight city hall syndrome, and things are kept moving and changing. Uh, so quickly that even if you do succeed in one particular area, well, guess what? Next year it's something else. In this case, it's just repackaging. Common Core is, to a large extent, uh, what used to be outcome-based education uh, based on the national education goals, from which you got America 2000 under George H.W. Bush and Goals 2000 under Bill Clinton. It's somewhat different, but not that much. It's the same sort of principle. But like I said before, now they're increasing the breadth of this thing uh, because they, as Dr. Stan said, when he advocated people get their children out of the public schools and homeschool, uh, these people are not idiots. They know that. They know that that movement is afoot. They know that there's an increasing number of homeschoolers, for example. And that's one reason they're pushing Common Core because they have determined that you know, it, they're going to have trouble unless they coerce the homeschoolers, private schoolers, parochial schoolers, you know, probably whatever it is, into aligning their curriculum at home, whether they like it or not, with Common Core, because that's the only way the little homeschooling Johnny is going to get in UCLA or wherever it is, because he's not going to do well on the SAT uh, tests, which are being aligned with these Common Core principles. Uh, and so what you what you have is you're going to have a national curriculum, and uh, the, the, that curriculum will largely be adopted even by the private schoolers, you know, parochial schoolers, the homeschoolers. If they don't want to, but if Johnny's going to get into UCLA or any higher education, uh, Johnny's going to have to do well on the SAT or ACT uh, college entrance exam. Uh, and uh, the only way Johnny's going to do that is if he, you know, reads Judy Bloom or something, you know, and, and it's a matter of literature and not, uh, you know, various classical literature. That's one of the things in reading literature in Common Core. They have a lot of manuals, and you'll ask if it, well, you know, people have to deal with manuals today. Re yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but why don't you start just by focusing on being able to read, period, as in their literacy is, like, abominable, and they, you know, can't go past the third grade without falling behind because they're illiterate because of look, say, and see Dick run and see spot jump and all of that, which John Dewey and his progressive educators deliberately concocted uh, for this exact purpose. Why? Because Dewey's mentor was G. Stanley Hall, who was the first uh, Ph.D. under Wilhelm Wundt at Leipzig, and Wilhelm Wundt's grandfather was a member of the Illuminati, codenamed Raphael. And let me just point out that certainly, uh, if you go to China, you go certainly into India, why they're pushing excellence in education. Oh, yeah. And these children are getting uh, trigonometry and calculus yep. and all sorts of things in school. They're preparing them for excellence. Uh, they are certainly doing everything to create mediocrity here. In America, they know exactly what they're doing, and you're not going to hear about it because the media is rigidly controlled, the education system is rigidly controlled. Yes, even many of our churches are rigidly controlled. Go right ahead, Dennis. Okay, so the, the point is, uh, it, in the past, you might have rallies that would accomplish something. Even if you had to have three or four rallies, they, there was a plan, the people had focus, they weren't uh, distracted by many other things, and so they could really accomplish something. Now, though, if you keep people thinking about the now, 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 what do I have to do now? What you do is you wear them down over time, 
uh, they don't really want to think about, oh, my goodness, you mean we might have to have five rallies going into next month? Well, I, you know, I just can't deal with that. You know, that's, that's in the future. You know, who, who knows? I got, you know, I got something. I got to pick up Susie tomorrow, and I got to go to the airport because Aunt Tilly is coming in. And then I got, you know, all of that stuff. You keep them busy, and that is nothing new. I've mentioned before, I won't belabor it, but Nero did that. You know, keep them busy. Give them circuses. Give them entertainment. Keep them busy, and then you can do pretty much uh, what you want. And so that's what they're, they're doing, uh, basically. Now, during the last part of the program, I thought I would get to the uh, succeeding chapter of the book, which is about the Paralete and the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, people would say, well, that's, uh, that's very interesting, but, uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is you know, they're, they're sort of you know, not, not what we thought they were going to be. Well, uh, yes, they are. Uh, you just don't understand. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and the book I wrote about the Paralete, as Dr. Stan mentioned, the previous book, The Paralete and the Secret Nazi Plan, remember these sub-plans are part of the larger Paralete plan. So, yes, it is true that the Nazis did ally with the Muslim Brotherhood beginning in the 30s. Yes, it is true that this Arab Spring uh, stuff of uh, three years ago was part of the secret Nazi plan coming to fulfillment. Uh, however, remember the parallel in control. And if somebody gets a little out of line, you know, if, uh, if a particular president gets out of line, they may find... Uh, impeachment. Uh, they may go to Dallas, you know, they may whatever, or they may be a Gaddafi and have to go away, or, you know, they may have uh, uh, some sort of uh, hitman like uh, Saddam Hussein, the uh, CIA protected six member team trying to assassinate the Prime Minister of Iraq in the late 50s. Uh, and, and so what you have to understand is that when the Muslim Brotherhood sort of got a little too independent, you know, like more, uh, like uh, Mossadegh in Iran, it was okay for them to have the nice election. But when he nationalized the oil, the British and American, you know, CIA and uh, MI6 and so forth, they didn't like that. And so, if you go, if you're one of the people we have designated, like a Gaddafi or a Saddam Hussein, as you know, we designate you as the leader. It doesn't matter if you're a you know Central American dictator. Where yes, yes, we you you're our guy. As long as you play ball with them. But if you if you start acting a little too independent, like Richard Nixon did, then you know you you, you can be removed one way or another for, from office. And so when the mother, Muslim Brotherhood started moving too quickly towards Sharia, when they started torturing uh, people in the same prison that Hosni Mubarak had tortured people, when they started excluding uh, secularists and others from the government, well, that was going too far too fast too far, too fast. And so all they had to do was call up the generals in Egypt who were are been bought, CC, as the leading general, and say, uh, you know, put them down. Just, just put them down. And so you, you had the other day a judge ordering the execution of, you know, 600 and some Muslim Brotherhood members. Some of them hadn't even been informed of the charges against no, no, them. This, this is in Egypt. In it? Egypt, right. yeah. Now, they say, well, we can appeal, you know, to the, the mufti of the area and so forth. And, and all that's true. Uh, but the point is, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is a, a creation of the power elite, a creation of British intelligence uh, with, you know, the OSS in America, largely British intelligence in uh, 1928. And remember, British, Britain in 1928, about 1901-02 up to 1939, was run by this group, the Cecil Rose Group, the Milner Group. So in 1928, when the British are creating the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and, and it was it was before that they started with Al Husseini and you know the designation by Herbert Samuel that he would be the administrator of Palestine and all that sort of stuff. But, but I think the, it's so important, uh, Dennis, just to briefly mention why would the British be creating the Muslim Brotherhood? Because you need an enemy. You have to have an enemy to rally the people behind you uh, against that enemy that you've created. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and and so they would create the Muslim Brotherhood. And then we create Hitler, and so then the aligned, uh, allied Hitler and the Muslim Brotherhood, both creations uh, of these people uh, during the 1930s. And that's what uh, Rudolf Hess was doing when he went over there to trying to talk to the Cliveden set, because the Cliveden set, or we would say Cliveden, is part of the Milner group and the whole there's the Cecil block and the Cliveden group and all of those uh, people are, are involved in the old Cecil Rhodes, or they say Cecil, Cecil Rhodes plan. And so uh, that's, uh, that's why the Muslim Brotherhood was and still is important. You say, what do you mean still is? Well, you got to remember, it's more than Egypt. Boko Haram. Boko Haram is affiliated with al-Qaeda. 
And, and the Muslim Brotherhood has, uh, to some extent, cooperated with al-Qaeda. I just mentioned how the al-Qaeda people in Libya went with the cooperation of the Muslim Brotherhood through Egypt, sending weapons up to the Syrian rebels, and through Egypt up to Hamas. So, yeah, they're different. The Muslim Brotherhood is different from al-Qaeda, but they work together often. They work together. And, you know, we, you know, we, we help them all. We help the Brotherhood. We help al-Qaeda. We, you know, we fund all of this. In fact, uh, when the, the Wahhabis uh, were uh, picked up by uh, Osama bin Laden, and he goes to Afghanistan, he goes all over the place. But he goes to Afghanistan, and we're, you know, in the 1980s, and it's jihad against the evil Soviets. I believe it was Nebraska. The University of Nebraska is the one that uh, printed up 25,000 or whatever it was, textbooks to send over in their language to Afghanistan to teach the little children about jihad against the foreigners. Oh, okay, so when the little children, you know, 10, 15 years later grow up, and they're now 21, and they're jihadists, wow, what a surprise. You know, they're against foreigners in the land. You know, who could have thought? Well, the Pali thinks. They know this stuff. They know it's going to happen. It's, it's all it's all planned and plotted. So anyway, this particular chapter, the next chapter is the Pali and the Muslim Brotherhood. And it, it is worthwhile because the Muslim Brotherhood has not gone away. They are not dead. They just, you know, they acted a little too independently in Egypt, and so they got slapped down. All right, so this chapter, I begin it by saying Lord Herbert Samuel was one of the first people that I have found uh, to refer to the establishment of a, quote, new world order. Now, Woodrow Wilson back uh, this date, and Samuel said this twice. He said it in the House of Lords, May 16th and August 7th of 1918. It is true that Woodrow Wilson, I believe, in 1919 talked about a new order of the world, but the term new world order, he's the first fellow, Lord, Lord Herbert Samuel, who's one of these Milner types implementing these Rose's plan. Uh, as a member of the Milner group that controlled uh, the British foreign affairs from the beginning of the 20th century until World War II, uh, Herbert Samuel in 1921 appointed, uh, they call him Hajj, Hajj Amin al Husseini. He appointed him as Mufti and head political administrator of Arab Palestine. Lord Alfred Milner, who was in charge of executing the paralyzed member of Cecil Rhodes' secret, quote, scheme to take the government of the whole world, remember that's what he said, he, Milner, on June 27th, 1923, in the House of Lords, said regarding Palestine that there, quote, must always remain not an Arab country or a Jewish country, but an international country in which all the world has a special interest. I think some man, capital M, mandatory, capital P, power will always be required, end quote. And, and that's their view, a and, mandatory uh, power controlling. And let me just point out that simply within the next two weeks, the Pope is going to, uh, to going to the uh, uh, to Israel, and he's asking to be given a large part of Mount Zion, and it's very possible that this will <laughs> come about. We'll be back in just a moment here with Dr. Dennis Cuddy to wrap up the program. All right, Dennis, you got about three minutes to wrap up the program. Okay, well, just uh, as an aside to what you what you just said about what the Post going to do, it, it, it has struck me sometimes curious how we are demanding, uh, on the one hand, uh, that Netanyahu and the Israelis remove the settlements from the West Bank. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what America largely got has been stolen or through lies from the Indians. You know, uh, Andrew Jackson, when he had the Cherokees go from uh, around the area of Georgia on the Trail of Tears where a lot of them died out to Oklahoma, it was, and they didn't resist uh, because, you know, Jackson would say, oh, well, you know, okay, if Jackson says we can trust the great white father, yeah, sure. He said, if you go out there, you will have all land west of the Mississippi in perpetuity, right? And then they found out how long perpetuity lasted, you know, until some settlers moved out there, or some gold, whatever. And so what would happen is the American government would, you know, they would allow the settlers to move out west. Then the Indians would say, well, hey, you know, you promised us all this land. And then the cavalry would say, well, we've got to protect these Americans. I mean, you know, they're out there. And so the Indians would say, well, why don't you keep them back east of the Mississippi? Well, we can't do that. And so what if the Indians, the Native Americans, did the same thing that they're saying over there? Say, okay, we'll remove them. And we'll say, well, that's unrealistic, you know. And, and so, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's a farce. There's a lot of hypocrisy going on. So finishing up, while al Husseini was in Palestine, Hassan al-Banna founded the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 1928. And it's been uh, from that organization 
that you have these various radical Islamic groups, such as Hamas, Islamic Jihad, which was located in the city where I am, in North Carolina, and Al-Qaeda have come. And uh, I would remind you that Mark Hosenball, he's the one I had to talk with, and Michael Isikoff of Newsweek have reported connections between Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood members, Mamoun Adarika Zoundli and Yusuf Nada. They, 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 I mean, it's not just there's some general connections. You have specific connections between these groups, the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda. And former CIA agent, a agent Robert Bayer, uh, who Dr. Stans mentioned before, in Sleeping with the Devil, explained how the U.S., quote, made common cause with the Muslim Brothers and used them, quote, to do our dirty work in Yemen, Afghanistan, and plenty of other places. So it's not like just there's some group over there. Remember, this is Robert Bayer, CIA agent, 25 years. He said, we got them to do our dirty work in Yemen, Afghanistan, and plenty of other places. So this shows what Dr. Stan was saying. We are connected. We are behind these groups. We're getting them, the Muslim Brotherhood, to do our dirty work in various places around the world. And we're going to have to let you go down and talk to you again next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, God bless. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly uh, we do talk during the breaks here, and if you want to get uh, everything that Cuddy said, and believe me, this is vitally important. Why, Chris, certainly you can order this uh, tape or a CD, or you can certainly go to our website, BradyLiberty.com. It'll be posted there. But you need to understand we're financing this whole world terrorist movement. Why? It's a great distraction, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great distraction, and most people find it so difficult to believe we would be funding the best enemies money could buy, but that's exactly what we are doing. You need an enemy, so you can then you can justify uh, uh, watching all the American people, uh, you can tapping their telephones, uh, suddenly, uh, suddenly monitoring where their cars are going. Everything we're doing today is being carefully monitored. The NSA is lying about this. We're moving towards a dictatorship. There is a small city ruling elite controls both political parties and make mockery of what's going on today. And if you haven't read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, you need to get it. Brotherhood of Darkness, you get it by calling 1-800-544-8927. 800 Five four four eight nine two seven. Now, if you don't have the funds for it, you can go to our website, RadioLiberty.com. RadioLiberty.com, and you can actually uh, pull down the DVD from which the book came. Uh, of the Sydney, the, the the talk didn't come from the the book. The book came from the DVD, and it is available at RadioLiberty.com. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we were involved in the spirits of battle. Uh, there really are demonic and satanic forces throughout the world today. And if you don't have a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't tapped into the supernatural power that is there to those who really believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, remember the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Well, certainly it's the Holy Ghost that is inhabiting, inhabiting the Christians in the world today. We're involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. And quite frankly, we need your help. Well, so we need your help financially. As you know, we have five hours a day. Uh, we have programs on five hours a day, five days a week. We do more than anybody else in the country. But it's an expensive proposition. You can join the Radio Liberty family of supporters uh, for $20 a month or really whatever you can afford. And then, of course, uh, we hope many of you out there are in your position to donate to us, at least to buy the various products we have, the books, DVDs. We also have certainly health products. We have a Berkey water products. We have all sorts of products. And you can read all about them at our website at radioliberty.com. Radioliberty.com. We have followers all across the country. And I will tell you, we saw the most wonderful letter today from one of our listeners, never had written before, just talking how our ministry since he introduced him to the spiritual battle that is being fought. This is not a political battle. This is not an ideological battle. This is not a cultural battle. This is a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. We're on the verge of an economic collapse, and you better start making your plans accordingly. We need your financial help. Our telephone number is one 800 
544-8927 if you're in a position to help. 1-800-544-8927. And we know a lot of people are having real economic problems today. And so if you're not in a position to help us economically, then we ask you to pray for Radio Liberty, for our provision and for our protection, to go to our webpage, to watch our DVDs, to listen to our radio programs, to read our material there. Again, our telephone number is 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Tell others about what's coming down the line. Because, of course, most people are going to lose their pensions, their annuity, their life savings, everything that's tied into the dollar. And if you listen to our programs regularly, you'll learn at least some of the things you can do to protect yourself and your family from the terrible times that lie ahead. So this is Dr. Stan. It's Friday. We'll be with you again next Monday. I know 1-800-544-8927 until Monday. May the Lord be with you.